Good evening. Welcome. My name is Doug Denial. I'm VP of Educational Programs here at Liberty Fund. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Liberty Fund and our offices. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to have people here to see where we live and work. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this lecture. Uh, the lecture is part of a larger series uh, called Adam Smith's Enlightened World. Um, this was uh, funded by a generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, we're interested in promoting Adam Smith in various ways through scholarship, lectures, reading groups, uh, and an online presence that uh, Amy Willis, my colleague, will say a little bit more about later on. My job is to uh, just quickly introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Carolyn Bashirs, uh, uh, who is at St. Lawrence University, a literature professor, which is in upstate New York. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Virginia and specializes in 18th century British literature. She teaches courses on fairy tales, British literature, Jane Austen, among others. Uh, she joined us the past year as a visiting uh, Smith scholar and stayed in our offices and uh, did an interesting paper then. I have no doubt this will be even more interesting. I wouldn't have put Frankenstein together with Adam Smith, but that's why she's lecturing and I'm not. So uh, <clears throat> please, please welcome Carolyn, Dr. Carolyn Christine. Thank you so much. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here and to be talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Tonight I'm going to argue that Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments is an overlooked ethical framework that helps us understand the deeper debates and the horror of Frankenstein, especially in relation to the family and beneficence and justice. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Frankenstein and the ways in which the theme of family has been read traditionally in Frankenstein, and then suggest how introducing Adam Smith can enhance our understanding of the novel. Then I'm going to move into a discussion of Victor as the creator or the parent of the creation and talk about his role in relation to beneficence and duty before looking at the creature and the questions that he raises about justice. In the conclusion, I'm going to reinforce my arguments and I hope open up some debate, some discussion about how you think these issues relate to us today. So, in 1818, Mary Shelley published Frankenstein, a novel that she later termed My Hideous Progeny. Since then, that progeny has been extremely prolific. It has uh, produced many, many adaptations and has assumed what many scholars call the status of myth. The novel continues to resonate because it raises issues with which we are still grappling. Is it okay, as in the film Ex Machina, to create artificial life? If so, what are the responsibilities of the creator? Um, is it okay to genetically modify food, like golden rice? This is a hotly debated topic. Is it okay to genetically modify babies, designer babies, if you can make it so that your baby doesn't have Alzheimer's? Would you do that? These are problems very much alive today. So to understand this novel is, in some ways, to understand our world. Today, I'll be focusing on problems signaled by the title page, the relationship between creator and created, father and child. Shelley signals that concern by subtitling her novel, The Modern Prometheus, the mythic titan who uh, defied Zeus. And in some versions, he brings fire to man. In some versions, he molds man out of clay, as in this image of a Roman fresco. Shelley pairs the subtitle with an epigraph from Milton's Paradise Lost. In this quotation, Adam complains to God, did I solicit thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? So what Shelley does on her title page is to create a dialogue between the creator and the created about their respective rights and responsibilities. The parent-child relationship was of particular importance to Mary Shelley as she was writing Frankenstein. 
Um, so before she started that, in February 1815, she gave birth to a little girl who died before she could name it. And if you read her journals, they're absolutely heartbreaking on this. She writes, find my baby dead, a miserable day. But it's a journal entry for March 19th that really evokes Frankenstein. She writes, dream my little baby came to life again, that it had only been cold, that we rubbed it before the fire and it lived, not in good spirits. This fantasy of animating the dead matter Okay, is something that we're going to see again in Frankenstein, which she began writing a year later as part of a challenge uh, during a house party um, with Lord Byron and Percy Shelley and John Polidori. The ghost story, of course, is part of um, a, a shorter version of the Gothic novel that uh, Mary Shelley would write. And from the start, the Gothic novel is very much about dysfunctional families. The very first Gothic novel is here. It's uh, Horace Walpole's The Castle of Toronto. And in this novel, the patriarch Manfred decides that he's um, going to divorce his wife or annul the marriage of his wife of 20 years so that he can marry the fiance of his dead son. She's, she's not enthusiastic about this. <laughs> like all Gothic heroines worth their salt, she runs away, of course, in an underground labyrinth, okay, where she meets the novel's hero, Theodore. So Manfred becomes incredibly jealous of, of Theodore and thinks that Isabel is, is going to run, run away with him. And he manages to track her to a church where she sees, he sees Theodore and a woman. And he runs up and stabs her, only to discover that it's his daughter, Matilda. Okay. This is the Gothic novel. <laughs> Families, okay, there's murder. Uh, if you look, flash forward a little bit to Matthew Lewis as the monk, murder, incest, necrophilia. Families are not happy places, okay? And so Mary Shelley is writing a Gothic novel in this tradition. If she's wanting to write about the family problems, this is, this is a genre. What's new in Frankenstein is she's integrating the Gothic with science fiction. This is an original thing. And in so doing that, she makes the father and that family dynamic especially complex because there is no mother. He's creating alone. Anne Malore notes, Frankenstein portrays the consequences of the failure of the family, the damage wrought when the mother or a nurturant parental love is absent. Over the last 30 years, there have been many, many analyses of the family from different perspectives looking at this problem. Among them, the biographical and literary contexts loom large. Such interpretations tend to emphasize these three figures. On the left, Mary Shelley's distant father, the philosopher and novelist William Godwin, is the preeminent radical philosopher of the 1790s. In the center of the novelist and philosopher Rousseau, famous for his novels, infamous for abandoning five children in orphanages. And then on the right, to a lesser extent, Mary's husband, Percy Shelley, a genius, but also a problematic figure. Adriana Crassian expresses a prevailing scholarly assumption when she says, by ingeniously overlaying this series of flawed father figures who neglected their children, so Victor, Godwin, Rousseau, Shelley is able to evoke their most powerful political claims while holding them subject to the critique of domestic affections and of gender, which their consistently masculinist political liberties denied, Crassian says. So the novel, she's arguing, is promoting their political ideals, but critiquing them as father figures. OK, so what can Adam Smith add to this conversation? Okay. Smith is not often read in relation to Frankenstein, although a few people have worked <laughs> toward this. The, there's been some really interesting work recently done on, on uh, Frankenstein and sympathy in relation to the theory of moral sentiments. OK. 
Okay. And this is, this is very helpful, and it's a nice complement to previous work by scholars like David Marshall, who look at sympathy in Frankenstein in relation to Rousseau. But there's just not been a lot of work done on Smith and Frankenstein. And, and this, I think, is a real critical omission. I want to introduce Smith as a way of addressing two problems that are identified by Lawrence Lipking in an essay. It's called Frankenstein, the True Story. And what, what Lipking argues is that there has been a real bias in interpretations of Frankenstein, a political bias that tends to stress readings that see the creature as the victim and the chief and only victim of this. Okay, so there's a slant in the readings that he argues um, is ignoring a lot of evidence of a more conservative trend within the novel. And that conservatism uh, becomes more evident in the 1831 edition, Mary Shelley's final revision of the novel, which contains a more conservative preface and has some edits. Okay. So what Lipking is arguing is that there's been a, a bias this, and that bias is seeking to resolve the meaning of Frankenstein into the creature is the victim. Okay. Um, that political lens, I think, is, is very real. I think Lipking's right about that. I think what I would add to that is that lens is actually derived from William Godwin. And Godwin's vision of humanity and society is, as Thomas Sowell notes in his Conflict of Visions, it's this unconstrained vision of human perfectibility. Okay. Um, the second thing that Lipking is arguing is that the lack of resolution, the, the, the very debatability of the novel, is at its heart. It's why it works, it's why we're drawn to it, and it's, it's what makes it terrifying. It's difficult, really, to resolve some of, some of that, those issues. Um, I think Adam Smith addresses both of these problems. And so I'm arguing that the theory of moral sentiments offers an ethical framework that's overlooked. And in readings of Frankenstein, it's a, it's a theory of virtue that represents what Soul calls the constrained vision of humanity, this idea that, that there are moral limitations in man. Okay? And these are facts that have to be accepted and dealt with practically. And this is, of course, the opposite of Godwin. Soul uses Godwin and Smith as oppositions here. So by emphasizing Smith, I want to point out how his writing offers an alternative perspective that helps clarify some of the ethical issues that have been overlooked or glossed over. I think the framework is especially helpful for understanding the horror of Frankenstein in relation to parenting and beneficence and justice. And Smith devotes considerable attention to those um, points, and uh, he depicts the parent-child especially, that relationship at the nexus of debates about beneficence and justice which is creating a debate that is itself terrifying. So, at this point you're probably asking, did Mary Shelley actually know Smith? Is there any basis for this? Um, what we do know is that Mary Shelley read her parents' works very closely, and her parents were very familiar with Smith's writings and, in fact, refer to him, engage his ideas, quote his ideas. Mary Wollstonecraft, in her Vindication of the Rights of Woman, is quoting Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Um, Godwin, in his, his political justice, is arguing deliberately against Smith's wealth of nations. He's trying to rework this idea of the impartial spectator. So she would have been familiar with Smith from her parents. But also she had access to her father's library. It's likely she read him there. And most obviously she refers to the invisible hand a couple of times in Frankenstein. And that term, of course, is most often associated with Smith at this point in time. So it is highly likely that Shelley was familiar with Smith's writings. So I'm going to start tracing this relationship with the first part of Shelley's novel. And the first thing we actually see when we move past the title page is the dedication to William Godwin. Um, it identifies his most famous works, uh, Political Justice, and his novel, Caleb Williams, which reviewers took as a sign that uh, this is a novel that's declaring the author's political allegiance to him. 
but it's also doing something else. Um, it's also an appeal to Godwin from his daughter. Okay, so she is like the creature, not named. She's just the author. Mary's mother died when she was born. Godwin was a very distant father. He packed her off to Scotland to live with acquaintances for long stretches of time. When she eloped with Percy Shelley, he refused to talk to her for three and a half years. Okay. So this is a novel about a creator who abandons his creation, dedicated to a father who is neglecting his admiring daughter. Okay. The preface is by Percy Shelley. And he, he writes that the novel, its chief concern is the exhibition of amiable, um, ami the exhibition of the amiableness of domestic affection and the excellence of universal virtue. Domestic affection. Okay, this is what he's arguing. This is a novel about domestic affection. This from the man who abandoned his pregnant wife to elope with Mary. Okay. This from the guy who, after his daughter died and Mary's home uh, weeping about this, is, is off gallivanting around town with her stepsister, with whom he's having an affair. Okay. Domestic affection. Okay. <laughs> this, this is the context. Okay. So, um, like Shelley's father and husband, Victor Frankenstein is full of brilliant ideas, especially when he discovers the, the source of life. But he's also short on sympathy. I love this cartoon by David Cypress that ironically foregrounds the real Frankenstein's neglect by depicting him reading a pregnancy book. <laughs> the problem, of course, is, not, is, is that Victor's focused on his ambition, not what to expect when you are expecting. When Victor anticipates his success, he says, a new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Victor's focusing on what his children are going to owe him, how grateful they are going to be. Smith provides a really interesting con context for this because he writes about mutual benevolence in the family. After himself, the members of his family, those who live with him, his parents, his children, his brothers and sisters, are naturally the objects of his warmest affection. They are naturally the persons upon whom his happiness and misery defend. And, and Smith goes on to say that parents actually love their children more than anybody else because the children are so vulnerable. Okay. But Victor, Victor unnaturally imagines only a race that blesses him. Imagining this glory, he impatiently proceeds to create his being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the being of a gigantic stature. That is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionately large. What is Victor going to do with this eight-foot creature when he brings it to life? What is his plan here? How is he going to fit into society? Where is the foresight of our modern Prometheus? Let's bring in some Smith here. Smith says the qualities most useful to ourselves are, first of all, superior reason and understanding, by which we are capable of discerning the remote consequences of all our actions and of foreseeing the advantage or detriment which is likely to result from them. And coupled with self-command, so you restrain yourself from you know, immediately, immediate pleasure for the long-term goal, that results in prudence. Frankenstein imprudently rushes to create his being, and it horrifies him. When he brings the creature to life, he says, now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room. Victor's horror is depicted here. The creature is left just lying on the floor, and Victor is rushing away. He goes to his bedroom, paces, and then lies down for a nap. <laughs> this happens. 
But the reader's horror is explained most clearly by Adam Smith, a parent without parental tendencies, a child devoid of filial reverence, a pure monsters. The objects, not of hatred only, but of horror. In this case, Victor is the monster. As Smith's writings clarify, Frankenstein's behavior exhibits not just a horrifying lack of parental tendencies, but a lack of any sense of responsibility at all. Smith observes that the laws of all civilized nations oblige parents to maintain their children, and children to maintain their parents and impose upon them many other duties of beneficence. It's a fascinating passage because it occurs in a discussion of the difference between beneficence and justice. Okay. Beneficence, he says, it, it can do no positive evil, positive evil, and so you can't enforce it by force. Justice is the opposite, right? The violation of justice is evil, so you have to enforce that. But this is occurring at the intersection of those two because people are very cautious about interfering in a home when you think maybe the, the father's not as friendly as he should be to his children, right? Where, where is that line? Charles Griswold points to this. He points to the case of parents, the duties of parents toward their children to exemplify the fact that the dividing line between beneficence and justice is not always clear. Smith acknowledges that in such cases, the sovereign may command mutual good offices to a certain degree. But of all duties of the lawgiver, this is perhaps that which requires the greatest delicacy and reserve to execute propriety and judgment. Okay. It's this intersection where we're getting a lot of the debate in Frankenstein. What does Victor <coughs> owe the creature? What does the creature owe him? What is a matter of beneficence and what is a matter of justice? Victor fails not just in a sense of duty, but in a sense of basic humanity and his unwillingness to sympathize with the very creature that he made hideous. Smith calls sympathy the exquisite fellow feeling which the spectator entertains with the sentiments of the persons principally concerned. But Victor feels and expresses only when horror when the creature comes to him. So Victor's taking his nap in his bedroom and the creature has just come to life. It shambles in and it's mumbling and it's grinning and it reaches out to him and Victor runs away. He just, he flees. And after walking the rest of the night, he comes home with his, Clair his friend Clairval and sees the creature's gone, and he's relieved. Okay. He's relieved. Okay. In the scene of abandonment, David Marshall argues that Mary Shelley is thinking about Rousseau. He points to Mary Shelley's later biographical essay on Rousseau that she wrote for the Cabinet Cyclopedia where she blames Rousseau for abandoning his five children to an orphanage, a receptacle where a few survive. And historically, the orphanages in France at that time, the mortality rate was about 65%. Rousseau, she notes, failed in the plainest dictates of nature and conscience. When we move a little further into the novel, we get the creature's perspective on what happens when he's abandoned. And it's fascinating because even though he has an eight foot frame, mentally and emotionally, he is still an infant. He's able to describe this with the eloquence of someone who has you know, been reading Milton, among other authors. But the experience he describes is, is visually captured here, I think really beautifully, in Gris Grimley's uh, graphic novel. The creature says, it was dark when I awoke. And then, there are no words in this frame because the creature in the beginning doesn't know words. He doesn't hear words. It's, it's a dark world. It's a cold world. It's blank. And he is literally rambling from frame to frame, okay, searching for something. Victor's motive in abandoning his creation becomes clearest when we look at Mary Shelley's preface to the 1831 edition where she imagines what the creator imagined as he, he was creating this monster. And she knows that, notes that his success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his handiwork. Horror-stricken, 
He would hope that, left to itself, the slight spark of life which he had communicated would fade, that this thing which had received such imperfect animation would subside into dead matter. He just wants it dead. This is a problem that Smith felt very deeply about. You may recall that in Theory of Moral Sentiments and in Lectures of Jurisprudence, he talks quite a lot about infanticide. And he says, can there be a greater barbarity, for example, than to hurt an infant? Yet the exposition, that is the murder of newborn infants, was a practice allowed of in almost all the states of Greece, even among the polite and civilized Athenians. And whenever the circumstances of the parent rendered it inconvenient to bring up the child, <coughs> to abandon it to hunger, or to wild beasts, was regarded without blame or censure. Um, this is an example Smith uses of when custom um, takes hold and how you have to resist that. So what becomes clear at this point is that Mary Shelley is critiquing a failure in parental tenderness in paternal duty and in basic humanity that borders on the practice of infanticide. And all this becomes clear through Smith's writing. The creature fortunately does survive, and he's able to share his perspective, which he reveals in the second volume. He's lonely, he's spurned by the humans he meets, and he figures out that Victor is his father my father, my creator. And so he begins a journey to discover Victor because he feels like if he has a claim on anyone, it's going to be his father. Well, on the journey, however, he meets more people who are very abusive to him. Like he saves a little girl from drowning and he gets shot as a reward for it. So he, during that journey, he encounters a little boy, William. He's eight, William Frankenstein. And he tries to kidnap the boy because he wants a companion. And the child is resisting. And the creature responds, Frankenstein. He says, the boy says, my, dad, my dad's Frankenstein. And the creature responds, Frankenstein, you belong then to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. And he chokes the boy, murders him. Again, we return to Smith on familial horror. This is a case in which it's the child as well as the parent who is monstrous and lacking any kind of parental tendencies or filial reverence. Um, Smith also is very clear on the laws of justice, um, noting that murder is the worst of them. The most <coughs> sacred laws of justice, wh whose violation seems to call loudest for vengeance, are the laws which guard the life and person of our neighbor. Not content with murdering William, he then comes across Justine, a woman whom he doesn't know, but is connected with the Frankenstein family. And he plants evidence on her to indict her for the crime. He blames her for it. He frames her. Um, his motive in doing this is clearest in the 1831 edition, where he says that she is actually the source of his crime. Not I, but she shall suffer the murder I have committed because I am forever robbed of all that she could give me. She shall atone. The crime had its source in her. Be hers the punishment. Okay. Long before we heard about incels, there's the creature. <laughs> Seriously. He thinks he has a right to a mate, and he resents that there is a beautiful woman that he is never, ever going to have. Okay? He, kn he knows this. And, of course, Smith is helpful in processing not only this, but the driving force behind it. You know, the resentment he's feeling. It, it, she's, she's clearly not the proper source. She's, she can feel pain, but she hasn't produced the creature's pain from design. And his malevolence results in her execution. So after her death then, so he's caused two deaths now, uh, the creature confronts Victor and says, do your duty to me and I will do mine to you and the rest of mankind. It's a fascinating moment because 
it's this scene, two years after Victor actually brought the creature to life, it's this scene where Victor finally says, for the first time I thought of the duties of a creator and what I might owe him. It's, it's a little late, but they start, <laughs> they start having this conversation now. Smith is quite clear on the duty between a father and son, even during separation. He said there are cases when people are separated and maybe they don't feel all the normal affection you would feel for someone who lives in your household. But even during that separation, people with proper virtues are going to feel like they have a sense of duty to one another. They feel like they're persons to whom certain affections are due. And so the creature, based on this, begins negotiating, okay, because it's all about what they're going to have, not this real affection. The creature says, you must create a female for me with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse. Does the father owe his son a mate? Victor reflects on this, and he says, justice due to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. And, he says, also the creature's really strong and scary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This, this decision, this, this request for a promise, and Victor's decision raises all kinds of ethical questions. Most obviously, you're going to make him a mate. How do you know that that mate is going to like you? This is what Bride of Frankenstein is all about. What kind of responsibilities are you entailing on this second creation without her permission? Okay. What about William and Justine? What about the justice that has to be fulfilled in relation to their murders? Victor's forgotten about this. Um, it, in relation to sympathy, um, does the creature have a right to, to a mate specifically? or just a right to Victor fulfilling his duties as a father in terms of sympathy and caring for him. The novel is full of these, these complex ethical issues. And when you read interpretations and you look at textbooks for Frankenstein, what you get is that particular slant that Lawrence Lipkin is arguing. The contexts that we're reading are the contexts that privilege the perspective of William Godwin and the radicals that followed him. An example of this is when Victor makes this promise to the creature. Um, the text that says, see William Godwin on promises, right? Because Godwin says promises in themselves are evil. It's wrong to make a promise to someone because if it's right to do, you should do it because it's right, not because you've made a promise. Okay, this is, this is the Godwin perspective. Okay, Smith has a much more complex discussion of promises and the theory of moral sentiments that can be brought in here to maybe get at some of the, the deeper problems that Mary Shelley is engaging here. Um, he gives this highwayman example. And he says, okay, well, say a highwayman comes up to you and, and holds you up. Okay, and says, you have to give me something, and if you don't give it to me, I won't let you go. So, you know, the, the guy, he's held up, says, okay, I'll give you what you want, and he goes home. Okay, so Smith works through this, and he says, okay, well, if it's just a question of jurisprudence, then the criminal who has extorted this promise by violence has committed a crime. But if you're looking at it in terms of the responsibility of the person who has made the promise, that's messier. Is it a little promise? Is it a big promise? Has he promised the highwayman $5? Maybe he should fulfill that promise. Has he promised the highwayman his children's college savings? Maybe not. Okay. Um, the scope of the, the promise determines whether you should fulfill it. But more than that, Smith says, 
violating any promise for whatever reason always leaves a kind of stigma because your honor demands that you fulfill it. And if you have made a promise that you know you shouldn't fulfill, then that in itself is a problem. And the magnanimous man, the really great man, is not going to make such a promise. He would rather die than make such an oath. Okay. If we think about this in relation to Frankenstein, Frankenstein is agreeing to this promise under duress, right? So logically, the creature has no right to make that demand. But the question then is, is Victor doing something that he ought to do? Is he obligated to fulfill that? Or is this, this um, promise forcing him to do something that would be unethical because it infringes on the duties to other people? We'll come back to that in a minute. A second example of this is um, the creatures demand that he get a mate because it's the only way he can be preserved from further violence. The creature says, I'm, I'm committing murders because I'm miserable. If you give me a mate, I'll have no reason to commit murder anymore. <laughs> That's his argument. And, uh, you know, my textbook that I give to students as a context gives William Godwin talking about solitary confinement. And he says, you know, solitary imprisonment is, is harmful. Shall we be most effectually formed to justice, benevolence, and prudence in our intercourse with each other in a state of solitude? The true soil in which atrocious crimes are found to germinate is a gloomy and morose disposition. Okay. So in this context, my students, they initially read that and say, well, you have to make him a mate now. <laughs> He'll kill people. Like he hadn't been doing that before. Okay, again, we need the counter perspective, which is brought in here by Smith. Smith says, you know, people see these criminals, and the criminals, you know, seem like they're pitiful, and you, you begin to feel sorry for them. You, you begin to feel compassion for them. And he says, but the wise spectators reflect that mercy to the guilty is cruelty to the innocent and oppose the emotions of the compassion which they feel for a particular person, a more enlarged compassion which they feel for mankind. So if you look at it from this context, Victor's decision has to do with what the creature has already done, as well as with, with the promise. Okay, so it's, it's raising a kind of complexity that we're not getting in traditional readings of Frankenstein. Okay, Victor mostly creates that mate he starts on it, he's almost done, it's a female, and he destroys it. Okay. Um, and he justifies this by reflecting on what could happen. He says, even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts of the New World, yet one of the first results of these sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I a right for my own benefit to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? Okay. So rather than make the mate without like, the ability to reproduce, which might be the easy solution, he just destroys it. So the context given for this passage of my book is Godwin again. And it's the passage in, in Political Justice where Godwin argues that uh, if there's a fire and the building is burning around you, the person you have to save is the most important person. Who's the most important person? Is, is it a famous author who's going to write a book? You got to save him. You don't save the valet. You don't save yourself. You got to die. You don't save your dad because you know that this other guy is more important. Okay, you sacrifice yourself and everything else. How Godwin has the foreknowledge of who's gonna be the most important, <laughs> who's gonna save everybody, who, who's gonna be more valuable, he doesn't explain, he just knows. Okay. And this is, this is, again, part of his idea of this sort of impartial justice that's moving toward the perfectibility of, of mankind. He also doesn't explain what he's going to say to his dad as he's like barbecuing in the flames. It's just, again, Smith is a counterpoint because 
he, he has this constrained ver vision of humanity. Like, we have limits. And he says, you know, the administration of the great system of the universe, the care of the universal happiness of all rational beings is the business of God, not man. To man is allotted a much humbler department, the care of his own happiness, that of his family, his friends and country. Saving the whole world, okay? Saving the human species because you think something's gonna happen, um, that's, not, that's not your job because you don't know. Um, and my point here is not that Victor should have made the May. My, my point is that Frankenstein is often not framed explicitly in this kind of debate between these visions. And we ha by bringing Smith in as a sort of counterpoint to some of this, we also get a, a, a deeper understanding of the debate. I also want to point out that this scene points out just how bad a Prometheus Victor is because the creature says, and I will be with you on your wedding night. And Victor says, oh my God, you're going to come after me. Just after he's destroyed the creature's bride. Let's think this through. <laughs> so the result is predictably tragic. Okay, In the end, the creature murders Victor's friend Clairval and murders... Elizabeth on the wedding night. This is the typical scene that we get when people imagine. This is the bridal chamber. She is in her bridal chamber, and where is Victor? He's wandering the halls, waiting for the creature to show up. Yeah. And the creature comes and murders her. Okay. It reminds us of the creature's frustrated desires and returns us to the, the theme of the Gothic and the family. He's not only murdered his father's bride, he's not only murdered someone who represents the mate he can't have, it's the mother figure he never had. Okay. The tragedy precipitates Victor's um, father to die, and then Victor begins to pursue the creature to the North Pole, where he dies. In the final scene, the creature justifies himself to the captain of the ship, Walton, um, where Victor died. And here, Smith's concept of justice is again really useful because Smith says by sympathizing with the hatred and abhorrence which other men must entertain for him, he becomes in some measure the object of his own hatred and abhorrence. And the creature tells Walton, you hate me, but your abhorrence cannot equal that which I regard with which I regard myself. Although the novel ends there, its impact remains. For the 1831 edition, Mary Shelley wrote a preface in which she said, and now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. Frankenstein continues to prosper because it raises issues we're still debating. What is it okay to do in your laboratory? How do you raise your children? What are your responsibilities to them? Do incels have a right to a mate? These are issues that are still relevant, and I think we can benefit from the insights of Adam Smith as we approach them. I've been arguing that Smith's theory of moral sentiments provides this kind of framework for thinking about the horror of the family and beneficence and justice in Frankenstein. Smith is um, a valuable source of wisdom, and my larger point is not just that he can help us understand Frankenstein, but that he can help us work through these problems today. Thank you. I'm hoping you'll stay for a discussion. Um, Amy has some things to tell you. Okay. Well, first, uh, we would be happy to entertain any questions. I have a microphone so we can pick you up. So. Oh. Yeah, one dimension of Smith that uh, fits nicely with your paper, and it's right in the section you were talking about just before universal benevolence is Smith's discussion of the man of system. Because at the beginning, uh, Victor Frankenstein is that. He looks at, the man of system looks at the world and sees a chessboard mm -hmm. and believes that he can move pieces wherever he wants. They don't have any will of their own. And clearly, as soon as he creates a sentient being, 
it starts exercising its own will. So that's another connection with Frankenstein. Absolutely, so. yes. Thank you. This this might actually uh, cut, in, relate in some way to uh, to Steve's question, but I was struck by the way that you began your presentation and the way you ended it by by asking us to reflect on what sort of uh, what sort of uh, insights uh, this story might have on some of these contemporary kinds of issues. And uh, it it I guess my question is or. What, what at the end of the day, what, what was Vic, what was, what, what did Victor do wrong? The way it seems to me that this story has has been mm -hmm. mythologized and come down, become a matter of, of sort of a, a myth, is that his his crime or his sin, if we want to use that language, which I think is appropriate here, was the actual creation of the creature. The way that this story has been mythologized, it's, it's this, uh, this kind of hubris or this, uh, this way of thinking of, about playing God or being mm -hmm. like God, creating life. And that's where all of Ex Machina and all of these other right. kind of cautionary science fiction fables uh, have come. But I'm wondering if that's not what Mary Shelley was trying to get at at all. Uh, if the actual, um, the, if she was not in fact critiquing or if his, an, an, the way that she's thinking of, of Victor, is that that's not his sin. His sin is being a, a wretched human being and a terrible father. Uh, uh, it's, the, it's, not the, it's, not the, it's not some sort of hubris or playing God, it's that he was bad at it. He turns out to be a bad God, uh, a wicked God and a bad father. That's his sin. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm asking if that sort of, uh, puts a very different kind of take on this whole uh, story and maybe also to, again, to come back to your sort of challenge to us, there's nothing wrong with uh, golden rice or, uh, or, or I suppose, you know, making uh, robots or uh, androids or something like that, as long as we're good creators, as long as we're, as, war as, long as we're benevolent, wise gods. Could that be one way of answering but, your, uh, uh, your question? Uh, that could be a great way of doing it if we could, proceed methodically and maybe not skip some steps because we're too hasty. Or maybe if we you know, avoid becoming the man of system, as, as Steve is pointing out, right? And thinking about you know, these things that we're making are going to have lives of their own in some way. I think it, it's fascinating with the, the golden rice example, right? Because there are so many scientists who say, this could cure blindness all over the world. And there are, there are groups who are opposing this, feeling like this is some kind of imposition of Western imperialism on them, and they're resisting it. So th this is a problem where the designer babies, right? Like, is, is there a limit to what we're going to do, right? Is it okay to, you know, try to, to fix things so your, your child doesn't have a, a disease like Alzheimer's to minimize that? But is that fundamentally different from saying, but I want my child to have blue eyes? Like, where, where is the ethical line, right? And I think that's where we're, we're not quite sure yet. So this was great, Caroline, and I'm, now I'm kicking myself for not having read Three Immoral Sentiments again before I wrote my book on family, because there's all this awesome family stuff in it that I, well, all right. So my, what, what's interesting here, though, is she's writing at a time when the family is evolving and marriage is evolving, and and I had you know listening to you, I kept thinking she's she's making a, she's critiquing this old model of parenthood and family, in some ways that sort of distance and all that and that and and what you can do here with Smith is to bring affection and sympathy in in explicit ways that are starting to appear within families, particularly at the kind of cutting edge of culture that these folks were at, right? That, that the family was changing there some ways more rapidly. So I wonder whether that, that isn't part of the story here too, that she's, she's riffing on what she's seeing happen in the world in front of her. And I'm curious in that regard about what, when you said she's more conservative in the 1831 preface, can you explain kind of what you mean by that? Yes, and it goes back to, to what Peter, what you were saying. In the 1831 preface, um, she says um, that 
the artist, the scientist, Victor, um, in her vision, when she's imagining Frankenstein before she write it, she said the artist would rush away from his creature um, because what else could you do if you mocked the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world? So in that 1831 preface, she is in fact saying um, Victor's crime or his initial crime is the creation of the being. Okay. In the the 1818 edition, she doesn't have that preface. What we get is Percy's preface about domestic affection. And, and what we see in that without her frame is a father who's not parenting and a child who's not very reverent to his father. So that's the difference between the editions. And but, you know, by the 1831 edition, um, Percy's dead. She's basically a single mother. She's got one baby left, one son. She's living on a very small allowance um, left her by Percy's father. And she's, you know, she's trying to work her way back into society. So she has all kinds of very real social and economic pressures on her that might account for that conservatism. Or it may just be that she repented her wild younger days with Percy, who was all about the free love. And, is, is wanting something more conservative. It's, it's difficult, to, it's difficult to, to, to determine that. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, th this is like, uh, you know, Cuban Vietnamese tacos or something. It's, just, <laughs> it's this unbelievable oh. fusion thinking that is fascinating to me. Uh, but that said, there, there are a number of lawyers in the room. And when you talk about the word, we use the word promise, it reminds me of the word contract. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, talking to my own uh, uh, emerging adult children, it's difficult for them to find uh, you, you, someone to interact with who doesn't have an 18th share of a parent because <clears throat> people have been divorced and remarried so many times now that, and, and these children have relationships that are scattered all over the country, all over the world, and they're trying to decide how they spend Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does raise this question of, uh, is having a child or producing some object or thing, whatever the right word is, uh, does it indenture us to a future that we can cannot escape from, that we have made the choice at inception that we, can all, that we can't contemplate later? This is a good question. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, Thank you uh, for the talk. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, so a, a lot of the discussion so far has been more about, in my interpretation, about the abandonment from the, from the parent side and, and some of the sins that involved in that. But whenever there is, whether it be today, a child that's been abandoned by, the, by his or her parents or uh, uh, it, uh, Frankenstein's monster being abandoned by his father, what is the role from either Smith and or uh, Shelley here for society to step in? Was there, is there any indication that, well, society sinned here by not helping this child out? Um, and uh, so I don't know if there's, there's any, any comment there. Well, what uh, Percy Shelley wrote in a review of the novel, which was published posthumously, uh, so this actually came out much later in 1832 or 33. Percy Shelley said that um, the direct moral of the novel is that if you treat a person ill, you entail upon him the responsibility of wickedness and misery. And it's framed in a much broader way of social responsibility. Um, I don't know if that's what you were what you were thinking about. I mean, certainly in the novel, um, the creature keeps running into uh, people who are very abusive. So um, at one point, he tries to make friends with this family that have a cottage, and he's been living in this shack watching them and trying to learn from them. And he goes in, and he introduces himself to the father, um, De Lacey, who's blind. And that conversation goes well because he can't see the creature. Mm -hmm. But when the children of De Lacey come home and see the creature, they beat him and run him out of the, the cottage. So the, the novel does show that 
there, there is a responsibility here for people to treat each other well. The problem is that um, the creature is out there wandering alone um, because he has no family to begin with to socialize him or to teach him or anything. And it's hard to hold society responsible, right? But you can pinpoint the father and say, you've had this child and now you have to assume some responsibility or it's going to wander out of control. I mean, the whole going back to Steve's point about the man of system, one of the other interpretations of this is it, the creature is often compared to the French Revolution, right? Which starts with really good intentions, and then somehow it just escapes control, and it becomes, you know, really, really deadly. And we get that reading because the period in which uh, the, the moment when when uh, Victor creates the creature is November of 1793. So the, it's, the novel is encouraging that kind of reading. And like the terror, I mean, the exact timing of the story, the way it's set, it goes through the, the terror. So like the, the most extreme murders and things that are happening, the reading with the French Revolution is, is a really fun reading for sure to do. Yeah. I, th I, think, I think the novel shows that there's a lot of responsibility to spread around here. I, I think that's true. But certainly the creature, you know, he's a, he has a responsibility not to kill people. Victor <laughs> has a responsibility to parent, yeah. Um, one of the things you said earlier on is, is kind of a, um, a bias of the reading where the, where the creature is a vic is victim. But if we were having a contest, it sounds to me like he's winning over the women because they're just getting killed. You know, like he at least has enough volition to be violent and to kill others, whereas it sounds like in the story, and it has been many decades since I read it directly, but um, the women are almost powerless in influencing this culture of responsibility. So what is, I mean, outside of the normal, you know, the the legal limitations or things of that type that, that are going on during the period. Is there something in the novel itself where the female, um, what would you say, the female responsibility or the female power in the culture or on those norms is flowing somewhere or am I missing something? Um, there are quite a few feminist readings of this novel that do see it as a critique of the way in which, well, a couple of ones. First off, part of the problem is that Victor is creating life alone without the female, right? And he's not nurturing it. He's abandoning it. And the proper, you know, sort of, mother figure, family figure would be Elizabeth, who um, writes these letters to Victor from home while he's off at college, you know, creating life. And uh, writes some letters, and, and, and they run along the lines of, hey, you know, Betty Sue down the street, she just got married. Hey, you know, these people, they just got married, right? She's like dropping all these hints. And when he comes home, um, his dad says, hey, you want to marry your cousin? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, but I have to go do something. He has to go make the creature a mate. I'll be back in a couple of years. Um, he, he keeps putting it off, right? I mean, there are all these ways in which um, Elizabeth is left at home waiting for him. And so it's a novel about her being disempowered in that way. It's a novel of partly about her missing out on the education, right? Um, that Victor is getting through his travels, through going to the university while she sits at home. And, and so I think there's a critique of that going on. You said that her mother died when she was young. So is it, is part, is, is it basically the absence of the female which is the point? I think that's part of the point or, or the absence. It, it's the absence by choice of the father not to include the mother figure. Um, What's especially complicated here is that Mary Wollstonecraft was, was famous for a vindication of the rights of women in which she educated that, that women should be educated. They should be educated as rational creatures instead of creatures of sensibility. 
and they have a right to this because they, they have souls in order to um, be virtuous. They, ha they need education. And so she had all these ideas about how to educate women to be good citizens, good mothers, good wives. She dies. She dies days after giving birth to Mary. Uh, William marries a woman who doesn't believe in any of that. And so when Mary is growing up, her father doesn't follow through on her mother's plan for education. So she's literally denied the, the, her legacy from, from her mother because they didn't feel like girls needed that. It was a, it was a looser kind of education at home. Now, the boys were sent to school, but, but not Mary. And the creature was brought into existence without a woman, right? So it's born without, not a woman. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, an interesting topic with the women. Thank you.